All right, let's take a look now at the kinds of harmonic uh, techniques that we want to use to really capture that impressionist sound. We've talked a lot about some, some things that play into this, like parallel and extended harmonies, but let's sort of expand it and really look a little deeper into sort of how does that all come together and how does that combine with the various senses of, or the various tonal systems that are being used as well, all right? So what we're talking about here is impressionistic harmony, all right? Harmony that's really... Um, captures the the sound of impressionism so we've talked about extended and parallel chords as i mentioned but obviously when we looked at it we were just sort of saying look they exist and we saw in the bar talk example that they were there really to just kind of um dress up the mode a little bit and and bring the mode that bar talk was using which was aeolian just sort of out of that strictly folk um, sort of older style. We're going to see that they're used with some logic here, but really we want to dive a little deeper and and investigate the ways that in Impressionism we're really trying to avoid conventions associated with traditional tonal music because we need a we need an approach that is going to sort of accommodate the many different tonal systems that are used in Impressionism. And this is sort of one of the first identifying elements of Impressionism, which is that we should expect to, to find many, many different tonal systems in a piece. And I don't mean, you know, when we looked at, when we looked at for instance, Beethoven sonatas, we, we were in many different tonalities, meaning we would start in G major and then go to D major and then maybe, look, we're in E flat major. Wow, that's amazing. But those were all major, major, major. And mixing in minor didn't really do much because we all know how much work went into making minor act like major through raising the leading tone, things like that. We're looking here instead at a much broader array across the spectrum of tonality. So whether that means using sort of major and minor, using um, natural minor, which is much more distinct, using the various modes that we could end up with, using pentatonic systems, right? There's a lot more variety that is captured by this. And these things all work differently. We know that even inside of the modes, each mode comes with its own sense of harmonic direction, its own sense of, of chords that, that sort of highlight its color tone highlight its unique properties so it's hard to to sort of see how any one system of functional harmony could really capture all of this and so there are some broad approaches that we want to look at here and the big 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 thing to discuss is the treatment of the leading tone because it, you know this goes all the way back to theory one right the way we think about, treat, hear, understand, or even use or not use the leading tone plays such a huge and significant role into the end result of what that music is going to sound like. And it's no different here in Impressionist Harmony. So let's take a peek at the relationship, we'll say, or the various relationships between Impressionism and the leading tone. We'll look at some examples here, or we'll listen to some examples here. So the main, the main approach, I know I said approaches, but the, the overarching um, sort of mindset here is that we want to either avoid or weaken the leading tone in Impressionism. Remember, you know, the tonal systems that are being used in Impressionism, or that are um, very at home in, in Impressionism. The modes, pentatonic systems, things like that. These all feature a much weaker tonal strength. And in many cases, that's a direct result of, of them not containing a leading tone, right? And in, we know that, for instance, Lydian is a mode that does have a leading tone. We treat that leading tone really carefully. Um, same thing we've talked a little bit about Ionian, like the major scale, as a mode. Well, in order to 
ensure that that doesn't sound just like good old fashioned major, right? You would want to avoid that because that's not really a modal sound. That's the sound of major. And it may seem a little strange to distinguish Ionian from major, but usage and harmonization can can have such a broad impact. So this avoidance or weakening of the leading tone plays into that sense of tonal ambiguity, which is at the heart of Impressionist tonality. And the harmony, as always, is there to really try to um, bring those aspects to the forefront. So let's look at three different ways that the leading tone will be either avoided or weakened in Impressionist harmony. The first and sort of maybe most straightforward would be to use different types of cadences such that, you know, cadences that are not five to one. So things that really would stand out here is if we're in a key, I'm gonna just do some parallel harmony. And if I wanted to cadence from this, four, that's an amazing cadence if we're dealing with a weaker sound. If I'm doing just sort of these lovely parallel chords, right? It would be a little strange to put a big old five on, even if I play it softly in there. four to one. See what I mean? That's a cadence clearly ending the musical phrase, but without using a five chord. Uh, similarly, this seven to one cadence, we've looked at a lot of uh, flat seven to one cadences that are just such an, uh, an important feature of modal music, especially if we're in a minor mode. Let's say we're in Dorian, right? We could do... Right? But even if we're just in a minor key or a minor, even minor, let's do minor pentatonic. See what I mean? Seven, one. This is minor pentatonic. That, that type of cadential material is super, super supportive of the type of tonal openness that Impressionism is all about. So cadences that don't involve five are obviously the most uh, straightforward example of avoiding the leading tone. But what if, what if we were going to use a five chord, but we just wanted to make sure it didn't have the leading tone? Because that five, one motion is still extremely strong, right? And Or extremely effective, I should say. I don't want to use the word strong. So we're going to find that in Impressionism, we do actually have sort of a dominant tonic relationship that comes into play a lot of the time. But the composers in this style were often extremely creative in not using the leading tone in these five chords. And this is a big place where extended harmonies comes into play. You can see here I've got like a 5-9 without a third. Let's get in there. So let's say, let's, let's just be in C for straightforwardness. A 5-9 chord in C major would usually be G, B, D, F, A, right? Which of course has the leading tone in it. But if we did Five nine with no third, there is no leading tone. The notes would be G, which is the root, D, which is the fifth, F, which is the seventh, and A, which is the ninth. And that still sounds like it wants to resolve. See how we get the benefit of Sol, Do. Without the T do. T do. See how much more closed off that is versus. Right? 
beautiful. We also see ideas that are sort of connected. I wrote the second one here as F over G, right? And we remember that when we have a slash chord like that, F refers to the triad. So here's F, A, C, that's an F chord over G, the bass note. And this could be easily understood as a 511 with no third because G is the root, B is the third, D is the fifth, F is the seventh, A is the ninth, and C is the 11. But I'm very clearly trying to tell the person playing this or the person analyzing this that I don't want a third. And in fact, F over G doesn't have a fifth either. So that's why sometimes it's just easier to write it like this, F over G, rather than having to write, if we're in C major, five, 11, no five, no three, right? That doesn't really work. But you can hear how this works super well as a five chord. Ah, ah. Because it already contains Do. So we get, again, the benefit of the sol do motion without that leading tone there to close it off. Really, really powerful. And then the last way that we often see this is with, if we do actually have a five chord, a dominant chord, or any type of harmony that has a leading tone in it, what we'll often find is that the next chord is a little muddy. This is actually something that jazz is really good at um, because if we do have like a normal dominant seventh chord, so let's say we're in this key and we got, here comes a five, seven. We got a leading tone. We often get, right? And that's just a tiny little bit of muddiness because I played a one major seven with the leading tone on top. but it can get a lot more muddy than that. So if we were sort of doing something like this, you'll often get these sort of chords that are derived from the pentatonic world. Right? So if we're sort of in this world, five, seven, and then pentatonic land. Right, so it resolves, but it's muddy. It goes into a much less clear place. So the leading tone is sort of rejected or weakened in that way. So these are just the three main relationships that we see with the leading tone where if we are going to use it, it's often leading someplace weak. But to sort of benefit from the strength of the sol-do relationship will either use a five chord without a leading tone or find another type of chord that can be an effective cadence. Oftentimes, like these two options really sort of have a modal, um, a modal origin. So hope you're seeing how all these different tonal ideas are coalescing into this impressionist style. Um, but we're really just playing around with the different types of tonal systems that are being used and responding to the needs to then sort of widen our harmonic techniques uh, in response to that.